Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here to introduce our master lecturer for this morning, Nikki Kasumi Clements of Rice University. Nikki was born and raised in the Bay Area, one of four very talented sisters who uh, all uh, were very gifted dancers, uh, particularly in ballet. Uh, Nikki uh, went to Sarah Lawrence to pursue that, but uh, an unfortunately placed stone or tree root or something, or wall, I don't remember what it was, um, caused a, uh, an ankle injury and redirected her efforts towards studying religious ethics, um, towards uh, critical theory. And she ended up taking that to her graduate work at Brown University, uh, where she uh, studied uh, Foucault and the historical and social criticism uh, that Foucault represents, focusing in particular uh, on both um, cognitive science and uh, cognitive theories of human experience. She attended a, uh, an interesting workshop at Stanford on cognitive sciences, uh, and also focusing on the fourth and fifth century Christian contemplative John Cassian, who is responsible for putting together the rules of uh, monastic order uh, that have been followed for centuries. So she's really, in many ways, her research represents what can uh, best be done by a contemplative humanistic approach, where she combines third person critical theory and historical theory with a genuine openness to the fact that the subjects that she's studying, the thinkers that she's studying, were human beings who had experiences, and their experiences were valid, and they have some epistemological validity, and they need to be taken seriously. Um, Nikki has, uh, in record time, finished an edited volume on, uh, called Mental Religion, the Brain, Cognition, and Culture as part of a forthcoming series, Macmillan Interdisciplinary Handbooks. Um, she, in general, specializes in late Christian asceticism and mysticism in late antiquity. And uh, she was also, in the 30-some-odd years I've been uh, teaching at Brown, she was my best TA. So without further ado, please welcome Nikki Clements. Nothing good, really. So much help. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Good morning. How are you all doing? Good, lovely. Thank you so much, Hal. Thank you so much to the Mind and Life Institute. Thank you so much to all of you for coming here today. It's an exceptional honor not only to be one of the many participants in this conference, but to actually have your ear for the next hour or so as we think about issues that I think are so relevant for today. These are issues of ethics. These are questions of how we shape ourselves as human beings. And these are questions of how we can overcome the chasm between religious traditions, between us and them, between then and now, and between each other. So I am exceptionally grateful to be here at this stunning conference with these stunning individuals, especially in the wake of a really horrific week, we'll say. Now, uh, Hal gave me my uh, autobiographical introduction up front. Yes, indeed, I was trained as a pre-professional ballerina in the, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And so I was used to performing but I was used to performing with my body. <laughs> Here, I'll be performing with my words, but don't worry, my words will also be about the body. So there's going to be a continuity that we'll see come in. And this continuity, in large part, was fostered by this figure, Francisco Varela, who is, of course, the noted co-founder of the Mind and Life Institute. And this work, Ethical Know-How, Action, Wisdom, and Cognition, contains a set of lectures that he gave. It was published in 1992, these lectures are from the Universita, uh, they're from the Universita de Bologna. And he presents here the theoretical infrastructure for a lively intersection between the contemplative uh, traditions of what he calls the three wisdom traditions of the East and neuroscientific research on embodied cognition. His foundational work on embodied experience, published the year before, of course, with Evan Thompson, Eleanor Roche, and the embodied mind had already opened the possibilities for thinking cognition and 
subjectivity in relation to a broader audience. This invitation from the Fondazione Sigma Tau and Edizioni La Terza requested that Varela speak specifically about ethical thought. Admitting surprise with the subject matter, Varela nevertheless gamely unfolds a stunning set of lectures that bring together his scientific expertise and his personal investment in contemplative practices. And why does he do this? He does it for a very urgent reason. He does it because of his firm belief that an understanding of ethics in a non-moralistic framework is crucial for our confused and confusing modern world. I don't know about you, but in 2016, in the wake of this week, as well as other global events this year, I think this need is more pressing than ever. It's even more pressing in 1992. And as many people at this conference have so wonderfully intoned, this is a time for contemplation, and it's also a time for action. So what, what should we do here? What am I proposing? I'm talking about an ethics as an everyday practice, as opposed to morality as a set of rational judgments. And why? Because morality, as you've so often seen, tends to polarize good versus bad, right versus wrong, us versus them, in ways that typically involve discrimination and preclude a pluralist ethos. Varela himself found it necessary, or at least useful, to move outside the so-called Western tradition in order to develop an ethics that was neither dominated by reason nor covertly egocentric. He describes Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism as enabling rigorous practice-based technologies of the self that allow people to become better to themselves as well as to others, not through indulgent Freudian analysis, right, which we can call the talking cure, nor through rational introspection, which I might call the Kantian cure. Varela extols instead these traditions' transformative practices that do not center the individual self, but are still capable of guiding individuals through this process of transformation. My lecture today will expand the domain of embodied ethics and practical knowledge to other domains of religious contemplative practice. I'll do this with a bit of a twist. For now that research and embodiment, cognition and contemplation has become so developed within the research fields of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, I will return us to the forms of Christianity that might prove similarly compelling from a comparative perspective. So let's take a minute in time travel. We're gonna time travel back to the late fourth century at this time, two friends set out from the shores of Palestine for the sands of the Delta Valley in, in uh, Upper Egypt. These two friends, their names were John and Germanus. This is John, known to us through history as John Cashin. They traveled to Scetus to train with ascetics renowned for their, quote, perfect way of life. These exemplary elders guide the young friends in the practices of desert asceticism. And from the joys of ascetic prayer, to the disappointing persistence and nocturnal emissions, these elders pragmatically present the psychological and physiological struggles of the ascetic life. At the heart of this professio, anchoring its struggles is the goal of what he calls perpetual and unceasing continuity of prayer. Here, I read such continual prayer as a practical activity precisely because one continually practices it. Cashin has this work called The Conferences. It's constituted by 24 books. And in the 10th, which is focusing on prayer, he speaks through the, the words of Abba Isaac, who tells John and Germanus, the end of every monk and the perfection of his heart direct into constant and uninterrupted perseverance in prayer. And as much as human frailty allows, it strives after an unchanging and continual tranquility of mind and perpetual purity. For just as the perpetual and constant tranquility of prayer about which we are speaking cannot be acquired and perfected without those virtues, neither can the latter, which lay the foundation for it, achieve completion unless it be persevered in. So what do we see in this passage? Well, we see an aspiration towards constant and uninterrupted perseverance in prayer. Right? We see an unchanging and continual tranquility of mind. 
we see the perpetual and constant tranquility of prayer itself. Constant, uninterrupted, unchanging, continual, perpetual, to render one's whole life tranquil. That is the goal of prayer. This is not abstract. This is not conceptual. It is practical in its assumptions as well as its aspirations. Isaac urges ascetics to tirelessly pursue and ceaselessly apply themselves. Constant labor of the body and fostering the emotions are essential and must be joined together through mindful attention to these tasks and their accompanying prayers in order to establish a firm and stable way of life. Tranquility of mind is inseparably and reciprocally linked to the labor of the body and the fostering of the emotions. So against readings that stress separation or tension between mind and body, spirit and flesh, I urge that we read Cashin's practical ethics through a tar tripartite lens that allows us to see how mind, body, and emotions together constitute subjectivity and are all essential to living purposively. For Cashin, contemplative life requires the practical life and vice versa. In the language of the Greeks, teoria requires eschesis, eschesis requires teoria. So what's one word we don't see present in this entire passage? Well, we don't see the word Christ. In fact, we don't see any of the basic markers of Christian sectarianism. We don't see God, Trinity, damnation, salvation, certainly not homoousius for those of you who enjoy Christological controversy. The tireless pursuit, the acquisition of virtues, the elusive training of mind, these are the emphases. Training the body, training the emotions, training the mind. These are the forms of activity that illuminate Cashin's interpretation of desert asceticism at the turn of the fifth century. So as I proceed in this talk, I'm going to first compare Francisco Varela's conception of ethical know-how to the contemplative practices of early Christian asceticism. After a brief tour through a few key figures, I'll turn my research on early Christian desert asceticism, exploring the model of heart, body, and mind integration offered by Cashin, one of the tradition's greatest hidden interlocutors. My analysis of Cashin's embodied practices will challenge our received understanding of Christianity as dualistic and as renunciatory. Recognizing that those assumptions rely in large part on our habit of talking about religion in terms of beliefs and in terms of dogmas, Following Varela and reading Cashin, we can gain a rich understanding of contemplative practices in a tradition that has been popularly underrepresented from this perspective, despite recent developments in religious studies over the last 30 years. As I describe in the second part of my talk, there are perhaps surprising resources and contemporary understandings of embodied cognition. For both parsing Cashin's mechanisms and transformation and foregrounding the integration of bodily affective and intellective forms of awareness. When we illuminate Cashin's texts through research and body cognition, we are able to approach them from a perspective of lived experience, and so to reconsider the goals of subjective transformation. This reading opens room for us to reconsider the, uh, the, the terms of our own understanding of subjective transformation. We also open comparison on the basis of the traditions and practices actually reflect instead of accepting retrospective caricatures of Christianity, which portray it as a long and unbroken tradition of mind-body dualism. Right? So the central foil that we often see where Christianity is involved in this kind of modern Western understanding of the mind-body split, it's more complicated even modernity, but insofar as the modern understanding of mind-body split actually does persist within certain traditions. This is not at all the case in pre-modern contexts and certainly not outside of the Western context as well. So these are the ways in which we're gonna be troubling those very distinctions. We're gonna be troubling those dualisms and we're really working for an integrative model of human subjectivity. So while reading Cashin as a contemplative bears significant fruit for research programs, there are issues particular to the historical, institutional role of Christianity that make me cautious about engaging him practically in the classroom. In the third part of my talk, I give a brief history of the imbrication of university life and public education with Christianity, and state how there are particular anxieties about approaching Christian practices from too contemplative a perspective. 
I raise these issues not in order to undermine contemplative studies, but in order to challenge us all to think about how the study of religion and the practice of religion need to be distinct, and for my own sake, what normativity means to me as an ethicist working in the academic study of religion. I think it's vital to have these conversations within contemplative studies contexts where we can have a charitable and critical eye to these profoundly important issues. So today I'll show why it would be valuable for us to reintegrate the so-called Western tradition into the ethical project at the heart of contemplative studies, as well as my particular work in religious studies. My hope is that such analysis can also elucidate the necessary and basic activities common to many contemplative traditions. This helps parse forms of Christianity from modern assumptions of their dualism. It also helps us overcome the chasm that stretches between antiquity and today, when taking as representative sensational Christians like Perpetua, who dies dramatically, Antony, who battles demons in the desert, and Stylites, who stood on pillars for years. So beyond a re-inclusion of embodiment and ordinary life and action, in Varela's words, and our historical understandings of Christian cont contemplation and prayer, this work extends our consideration of sources for transformative practices, to include texts from alternative traditions and estranged times. Contemplative ascesis and transformation in these desert communities of Christian ascetics thus becomes yet another occasion for thinking about ethics from a pluralist perspective. So a history, a history of the Christian mystical tradition must start with the first great Christian, Plato. Or at least this is how Plato gets styled by early Christians struggling to harmonize their scriptural as well as philosophical inheritances. In his philosophical dialogue, Phaedrus, Plato harmonizes the philosophical life and its apex, Theoria, through the metaphor of the charioteer. An allegory for the soul, the metaphor has three parts, the charioteer representing reason and two horses, one motivated by lofty desires to gaze upon the good, and the other motivated by pursuits of physical pleasures and the satiation of appetite. When read through the tripartite schema of the Republic, the charioteer is considered rationality, the good horse, irascibility, or the emotions, and the bad horse, concupiscence, or pleasures. One must train reason, emotions, and physical pleasures to work together in order to fly towards the ecstatic vision of the dome above the earth. There, one gazes not upon the world and its worldly goods, but the very truth itself, the good and the beautiful. He says, but of the heaven which is above the heavens, what earthly poet ever did or ever will sing worthily? It is such as I will describe, for I must dare to speak the truth when truth is my theme. There abides the very being with which true knowledge is concerned, the colorless, formless, intangible essence, visible only to mind, the pilot of the soul. The divine intelligence being nurtured upon mind and pure knowledge, and the intelligence of every soul which is capable of receiving the food proper to it, rejoices at beholding reality, and once more gazing upon truth is replenished and made glad until the revolution of the world brings her around again to the same place. So this is roughly the, 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 the spheres of the cosmos, and one is peeking up and beyond the sphere internal to the earth. One is instead able to peer up and see the true nature of things. Keeping oneself aloft to enjoy this teoria, this contemplative, um, contemplative action, requires not just intellectual will or pure rationality, it also requires training the emotions as well as the body and the philosophical life as well. Now this term teoria will come to be equivalent to prayer for Christians, adapted first by Clement of Alexandria, who recognizes Plato's philosophy as not only continuous with Christian philosophy, but even an intimation of what would be revealed in the figure of Jesus Christ, which he calls the Word made flesh. He adapted Theoria as contemplation of the true, right, the good and the beautiful, understood in Christian terms as contemplation of the divine reality made flesh. Contemplation is fundamentally rational and gives insight into the true nature of things. So there are epistemic claims here at play. Origin of Alexandria, Clement's student notoriously renders contemplation part of all of our cosmic origins, where all souls once contemplated the Godhead. These pre-existent souls gazed in the style of Platonic Theoria on their creator, and only through satiation eventually grew bored and fell away from this vision of God. Note all the Platonic echoes. 
Souls that fell furthest became demons, those that fell least became angels, and somewhere in the middle were humans. As Origen teaches in his work on prayer, an allegorical mode of scriptural interpretation can help humans contemplate the divine once again by gradually recognizing the spiritual meanings of scriptural texts. Gregory of Nyssa, a Christian bishop of Cappadocia in modern-day Turkey, develops Origen's connection between scriptural interpretation and divine contemplation through stages articulated in his life of Moses. Interpreting the figure of Moses in the Hebrew Bible, which of course the Christians appropriated as the New Testament through an allegorical lens, Nyssa describes the path towards divine contemplation. He describes stories from Moses' life, calling these historia, interpreting these stories as allegories for the progression of every human in the mystical life. And he calls these interpretations themselves the teoria, because you're actually able to contemplate the divine through these stories. From the burning bush where Moses meets at God in initial ignorance, and recognizes him merely intellectually, to his ascent at Mount Sinai, into eventual darkness. He contemplates God, and as he contemplates, he realizes that he will never contemplate God fully. So you move from a few different stages of illumination, but it's a very active illumination. You move to contemplation, but at the summit, you realize that you exceed even contemplation, because God is an unknowable. And this institutes Gregory's famous understanding of epictasis, where we're continuously straining forward in desire towards God. Contemplation, then, occurs through negation, or apophasis, which becomes the mystical pinnacle for Nyssa. So informed by these figures, yet in a different context, we turn to John Cashin. He's a rather unsung hero, negotiating the socially and politically tumultuous late antique world. Cashin, who was accused by his much more famous contemporary, Augustine of Hippo, of being overly optimistic about human agency. Cashin suffered accusations of heresy and marginalization in theological discussions from 529 onwards, even though he has been read continuously in Benedictine communities as issued in their regula by their founder, Benedict of Nursia. So Benedict and his rule says for all Benedictine communities, you read Cashin every single day. Right, so Cashin is this kind of secret, practical support for the entire monastic tradition. Cashin's own frankness and his feeling that he needed to address the ethical urgencies of his time led him to write books on nocturnal emissions, on fornication, on chastity, amongst others. And these three books, at least, were, were not translated into English until the 1990s. So when we're talking about purity and prudery, <laughs> right, this is a very modern Victorian kind of concept. Cashin, however, did not have these hang-ups. He was not obsessed with the body and sexuality as such. He saw the body as natural, and he saw it as something to work with, not to work against, not to renounce. So who is this enigmatic figure, John Cashin? Nobody really knows. So I can't give you any actual firm biographical details. However, we have been able to reconstruct from the historical narratives and the archives some particulars. He was likely born in modern-day Romania, in around 360, where he was classically educated, and he came from a family of some wealth. He went to Palestine in his 20s and underwent initial training in a synobium in Bethlehem. And he's traveling here with his companion, Germanus. This is important because we see how this is a very intersocial kind of ascesis, where these two are constantly traveling together, those two that we saw at the beginning, Abba and Germanus. Now, these two friends there, they're at this Bethlehem uh, monastery near the Cave of the Nativity, and they get this really wacky roommate. His name is Abba Panufius, and he has been escaping his home monastery in Egypt because, as he said, he was unable to practice humility. And so he enrolls in this monastery in Palestine, hoping to be a simple supplicant, an old man there because of infirmity and age, as opposed to the true pursuit of wisdom. Now the joke's on everyone else, though, because he gets found out to be this very famous elder from the Egyptian desert, and his brothers come and take him back home. <laughs> However, these stories captivated young, ja young Cashin and Germanus, and so they eventually got permission to set off for the Nile Delta. So they're moving roughly from Palestine down and up through Upper Egypt. Here, they trained luminaries such as Evagrius of Pontus, 
and disciples of Macarius the Great. In this context, ethical struggle and spiritual warfare required that the ascetic require significant agency alongside divine help to progress towards purity of heart, what he calls puritas cordis. This is no Victorian obsession with purity, however, for Cassian's notion is a fusion of Evagoras' apatheia, which is an adaptation of the Stoic notion of not being perturbed by the passions, as well as Macarius' emphasis on the centrality of the heart. We actually see here an idea that's much more like the heart-mind, except for here I'm adding the body because it's, it's always there. It's just not heart-mind-body. And so this is part of what I'm bringing forward through my treatment of Cassian. Such a goal of the monastic life would then prove central to Cassian's own view of monasticism. Pope, first, uh, Pope Innocent I commissioned Cassian to, as he says, bring the wisdom of the East to the West, which is where he goes from Egypt. There are a number of purges there. He moves up to Constantinople, where he is an advisor to John Chrysostom. Chrysostom comes under fire for a number of reasons, and so Cassian and Germanus go to Rome to advocate for their friend there. It's all politics. It's all politics, but it's also all ethics. And so these things are always co-imbricating. Once he was in Rome, Pope Innocent I commissions him to bring the wisdom of the East up to Gaul. And so it's at this stage that we actually see the inauguration of monasticism within what we understand now to be the European context. So Cassian goes to Massilia, modern day Marseille, around 415, where he's said to have established two monasteries, one for men, San Victor, and one for women, San Salvatore. Between 419 and 425, he writes great twin warts, the institutes and the conferences. And these works were distributed to monastic communities around Southern Gaul. He writes these as letters to other people asking for advice on how to actually engage these practices. They want role models, they want exemplars. And so what Cashin does, he brings these elders to the page so that they can be spread through the land of Gaul. These elders who are as saintly as they get, but still so human, still struggling, they're still dramatizing the ways in which one is continuously negotiating the battles of depression, sadness, anger, lust, gluttony. So there's a very realist perspective here. Cashin then distinguishes himself with his geographically as well as culturally diverse experiences, living as an ascetic in the deserts of Egypt, as advisor to Chrysostom in Constantinople, and the resident sage for monastery in southern Gaul. Cassian's living through a time when the Roman Empire is falling to the Visigoths and Vandals and in tandem Christianity was fortifying its institutions and its doctrines. This tension between the decaying imperial and the burgeoning Christian social structures contributes to the social context for Cassian's readings, which both affirm the authority of tradition and promote a comprehensible way of life that one necessarily has to adapt to oneself, to the specifics of one's geography, to the specifics of one's own physiology. So tradition is there, but so is adaptation as this really basic principle. Cassian's has translated them between Eastern and Western Christianities. He's actually considered a saint in, uh, in Orthodoxy, but he's considered more or less a heretic in, in Catholicism. So it's really interesting, the varieties of Christianities, of course, that we see at play. Cassian addresses his time of uncertainty and loss of meaning constructing his own version of a pragmatics of transformation in Varela's words. And in this respect, I think that he has much to say to our own ethical struggles today. We see prayer at the heart of Cassian's ascetical monastic works. In the Institutes, he describes the modes of canonical prayer that structure ascetic life in Palestine and Egypt. These have highly regulated hours, and they're more or less what you expect to take place in a monastery. In Institutes II, for example, we read about the nighttime offices of the Egyptians and the Palestines who pray at set hours. Books two and three systematize the relation between life and spirituality through the teaching of the Cenobia, in which prayer and labor bleed together. The basics of, as he says, the activity of the outer man are settled in the Institutes, and so Cashin turns in his other work, the conferences, to develop the foundation for ecstatic and ongoing prayer. In the conferences, Cashin presents these conversations that we're talking about between blessed elders and the young novices who are held up as ideals of the ascetic life. And these are ideals 
where their lives themselves are transformed into constant prayer. These desert elders celebrated continuously and spontaneously throughout the course of the whole day in tandem of their work. This goal then of making virtuous action into a spontaneous second nature is of course shared with other contemplative traditions. We see this in the Chinese philosopher Mencius, for whom spontaneity is at the heart of the moral life. Mencius says, all men have the mind which cannot bear to see the suffering of others. When I say that all men have the mind which cannot bear to see the suffering of others, my meaning may be illustrated like this. See, I told myself I just can't fall off the stage <laughs> and I can't vomit, but apparently I can't do a third thing, which is turn the entire presentation off. Now, right, you can feel for me I'm the child in the well in this scenario. When men suddenly see a child about to fall into a well, they all have a feeling of alarm and distress, not to gain friendship with the child's parents nor to seek the praise of their neighbors and friends, nor because they dislike the reputation of lack of humanity if they did not rescue the child. From such a case, we see that a man without the feeling of commiseration, sympathy, and empathy is not a man. Mencius' spontaneous morality in this passage has become a favorite passage for reflecting on pre-modern theorizations of embodied cognition. Francisco Varela, Ted Slingerland, and Bangai Sok value how virtue is expressed here without personal reflection. And for Cashin's beatified desert ascetics, a similar kind of spontaneity informed their practices. This spontaneity is not natural, but is trained and practiced through daily practices with an orientation towards cultivating one's whole life as contemplation. The goal of sculptural recitation, for example, is to make the psalters one's words one's own. He says, when we have the same disposition in our heart with which each psalm was sung or written down, then we shall become like its author, grasping the significance beforehand rather than afterward. That is, first we take in the power of what is said rather than the knowledge of it, recalling what has taken place or what does take place in us in daily assaults whenever we reflect on them. So basically, they come to embody the very scriptures that they recite unceasingly, right? They embody the very words of the scripture. They embody the very emotions being dramatized. And they also were reflecting upon those very words. As one reads and recites, one realigns one's heart or moral disposition, and Cashin realizes how difficult this is. His 10th conference, devoted to the question of prayer, begins and ends with the same singular instruction to repeat the Lord's Prayer. Germanus asks Abba Isaac, how do I achieve purity of heart? And Abba Isaac tells him to recite a single verse from the Psalms all day long. O God, make speed to save me. O Lord, make haste to help me. When questioned, well, what do you mean by all day long? Abba Isaac gives the friends what my partner refers to the green eggs and ham treatment. <laughs> I'm affected by the passion of gluttony. I ask for food of which the desert knows nothing. Um, I say this. I'm excited to anticipate the hour for supper. Uh, I say this in my own terms. All right, so this is just one set that's all concerned with gluttony, right? It's all about food, right? If I'm really hungry, if I'm anticipating my meals, how am I gonna make it through? I'm so hungry right now, I didn't have enough coffee this morning, right? In each one of these scenarios, this one psalm can address it. But he also <coughs> spends countless pages extending this formula to moments of sadness, say this psalm. Moments of happiness, say this psalm. When you have a headache, say this psalm. When you have insomnia and you're up at night working on your paper too long, say this psalm. In any given scenario, one is supposed to say this psalm because this psalm can be adapted. This is a fair fraction of the chapter on ecstatic prayer, too, mind you. So this rather monotonous list of activities and monastics busy day during which he should be praying renders this chapter almost a long prayer in itself. But in case we didn't quite grasp monotony, Germanus chimes in once more at the end of the chapter to ask how he should be praying all day long. Abba Isaac then has to remind him that just one line, that psalmic line, will do if and only if you engage in the forms of eschesis, the forms of practical activity that are partly constitutive of that contemplative activity. He then proceeds to reiterate the daily practices of manual labor, scriptural recitation, and reflective engagement that anchor this contemplation in everyday embodied activities. 
the effect is not the dismissal of the everyday, but the sacralization of everyday life. So we have now a view of contemplation completely rooted in the here and now. It's not the originist or the platonic noetic ascent. It's not Nissa's apophatic deferral. This reading of prayer is work and work is prayer, means that physical labor and the body itself are highly valued in Cashin's system. Following Evagrius' apatheia, the goal of the monastic life is pietas cordis, and Cashin stresses its attainment only through constant toil and a contrite spirit, as you go back to that first passage we saw. Cashin emphasizes, for example, manual labor and physical engagement as necessary. He astutely describes the thoughts as moving unpredictably, so to keep the heart grounded and mind focused, the weight of toil in the body is needed as an anchor. And when he's talking about physical labor, he's talking about cultivating the garden, weaving together the mats upon which one sits, writing out with an aching hand different forms of scripture, right? Uh, selling wares in, in, in the town, going out, jugging, or bringing your jug of water two miles a day. So we see here that physical labor requires so much attention precisely because attention to the body and the mind alike means that there's less room for the mind itself to be distracted, right? Once you're focusing on an activity, you are preventing your own mind from being overly distracted. Physical labor is turned into a prayer. The mind is slimmed down, as he said, to a reduced number of thoughts, and the whole person is able to integrate the body, heart, and mind and turn to heaven. Describing the connection between the physical practices of ascetic formation, Kashin extols Egyptian ascetics for their superlative integration of manual labor, scriptural meditation, and constant prayer. For they are constantly doing manual labor alone in their cells in such a way that they almost never admit meditating on the Psalms and on other parts of scripture. And to this, they add entreaties and prayers at every moment, taking up the whole day in offices that we celebrate at fixed times. Right, this distinction is between the compulsory recognition of the rule-based time of day to, to actually pray versus the voluntary service which you are continuously performing and giving. Right, you are making this into your way of life. The focus then is on bodily practices and continuous ritualized prayer in tandem with emotional entreaties and scriptural reading practices. I'm reminded here of Dogen's Zen Buddhist Tenzo Kyokun, which are, of course, the instructions for the cook. He says, after that, ready the next morning's rice gruel. When washing rice, preparing vegetables, and so on, do so with your own hands, with close attention, vigorous exertion, and a sincere mind. Do not indulge in a single moment of carelessness or laziness. Do not allow attentiveness to one thing result in overlooking another. Do not yield a single drop in the ocean of merit. Even a mountain of good karma can be augmented by a single particle of dust. So when I'm reading Cash and I'm thinking about the Zen cook, right, taking care of each little grain of rice. For of course, these instructions for the cook are also instructions for everyday life. Although there are some good recipes in there too. Mm -hmm. Cashin affirms that through such habituation, one can continuously and spontaneously perform the practices that are vital to the monastic life, while acting not out of blind adherence to a rule, but by continually adapting such practices to oneself and making them one's own. Making these practices one's own in turn reflects the intentional and voluntary nature of one's profession that is to commit oneself to a voluntary service, which is more pleasing than functions that are carried out by canonical obligation. The Egyptian ascetic does not merely observe the ritual practices at the regulated hours. He imbues his whole day with a sensibility of bodily, affective, and intellective attention, usually only achieved during intense moments of ritual contemplation. Physical practices constitute for Kashin an essential locus for shaping oneself, one's subjectivity, through the simultaneously embodied, affective, and deliberative cultivation of a way of life. So perhaps at this point, you can see why embodied approaches to cognition so fundamental to Varela's work and contemplative studies more broadly appeal to me as a historian of Christianity and as an ethicist. But you also might wonder why scientific research was important to this reading of Cashin. Right? If it's so obvious, as I've been explaining, couldn't I have just read him through this bodily, affective, and intellective perspective? Well, here, this is where uh, 
Hal's call out to me as a baby ballerina is relevant, right? Because having that experience growing up within that particular kind of profession, it gave me a sense of how training the body, emotions, and mind together is required for any sustained way of life. Accounts of understanding cognition that were hyper-rationalist, right, they seemed wrong to me. My body contributes awareness, my emotions contribute awareness, my minds contribute awareness. And if one wants to perform, one needs to integrate those things together. One needs to be fully present. Right? We have that idea of flowing cognition that Csikszentmihalyi High talks about. So with Cashin's practical, embodied, and affective emphases, I finally found a theorist who is calling attention to the means by which we operate in the world and the means by which we can shape ourselves. So what's the rub? Well, reading Cashin has proven tricky because of his reception. Critics tend to read him through a very binary lens. In his 1980s shift towards Western antiquity and ethics, French philosopher Michel Foucault genealogically traces to Cashin the obsession with the decipherment of interiority, the subject's exegesis of himself. Foucault overreads ways in which obedience, examination of conscience, and verbalization of thoughts come together to inaugurate a particularly modern form of disciplinary subjectivity, the form of subjectivity that is so popular within his works like Discipline and Punish, and yet which he turns away from slightly over the last eight years of his life. In contrast to his admiration for Greek and Roman ethics and self-fashioning ascesis, Foucault roots in Cashin's text the modern split between interiority and the self on the one hand and exteriority and the body on the other. Because the exteriority, the body, has these pleasures that need to be renounced in Foucault's reading. But as you've seen, Cashin and his practice-oriented desert ascetics are deeply concerned with embodied con contemplation and action. The integration of different sites of subjectivity, bodily, affective, and reflective, as well as the attention to cultivation of a disposition through practices by which one learns how to act spontaneously obviously resonate with many concerns in contemplative studies. In the study of religion, scholars like Amy Hollywood, who studies medieval Christianity with great theoretical nuance, have shown how ritual embodied practices shape practical reasoning. With the displacement of the primacy of rationality common to embodied cognition, I firmly agree with such a focus on embodiment and practice. What I investigate, it happened again, okay. What I investigate are the mechanisms by which such formation takes place. That is specifically, how does the body shape the mind, right? We talk about habitus, we talk about the kind of social inculcation by which we are shaped by these social formations around us. We talk about these embodied aptitudes but we don't adequately talk about the way in which those mechanisms are actually transforming us, and we don't talk about the way in which we could also be participants in that process. So my question is, how are we shaped? How does the body actually shape cognition? How does it shape the way in which we think and understand the world? And how might we also participate in this process better once we understand those mechanisms? We can call this the third personal perspective that scientific research can assist with. More particular to ethical formation then, I also engage Cashin's first personal perspective for his treatment of how humans do participate in this process by engaging bodily practices with affective motivations and reflective commitments needed to affect such transformation as well as navigate and negotiate day-to-day -day challenges. Or the day-to-day -day challenges to one's motivation, the way in which the body is tired and aches, right? the mind is overtaxed, we are now on day three, and of course, we are all both inflamed and also spent. So this is something that Cashin is very mindful of. Francisco Varela, to return to our initial interlocutor, poses two major problems. He asks, how can we understand ethical know-how as a result of habitual training in sensory motor awareness as opposed to the conscious domain of judgment that we see in Kantian morality? And then, how does this insight give us insight into subjectivity beyond the transcendental self, the fixed subject, the autonomous subject? Varela takes an approach to these questions, novel in the early 1990s, but they're still compelling for research programs today. He understands cognition as inactive, predicated on the embodied negotiation of everyday life and extended environments. 
through this approach to inactive cognition in Confucian ethics and Buddhist epistemology. Varela affirms an ethics as embodied every day and lived, as opposed to morality's rule-based assumptions. His ethical concern, in short, is with how everyday know-how is opposed to localized know-that. So I do suggest you pick this gem up. I looked at the uh, Google Citation database, and this, this text is only cited about 773 times, as opposed to his much more famous works, which are, of course, cited you know, almost 10,000 times. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah, around there. So this is a text that is so imbued with the kind of sensibility that he brings to his other research, but it also has an explicitly ethical orientation that I at least found so compelling when I first picked it up in 2008 that I, uh, I, I really just tore it to bits because my own practice of reading is very embodied. I left that on a plane, <laughs> and it was devastating. Uh, and then I had to practice non-attachment and get another copy. So his wisdom is still there and my scribbles were gone. So I think that was actually a good thing for all. But I do recommend you, you pick this, this gem up. We still have research that in embodied cognition, which continues today to provide another lens of analysis by which to understand the operations of human beings. The body is not just the physical apparatus for the cognitive agent. Rather, as Bangai Sok lucidly synthesizes in my edited volume, Shameless Book Pitch, Mental Religion, The Brain, Cognition, and Culture, the body and embodied cognition contributes four primary aspects of cognition. First, the interactive and bidirectional cycle of motor and sensation. That is, how one senses one's environment impacts one's motion within it. As we settle into our chairs, as we walk through doors, we learn how to actively navigate the environment with trained sensory motor interactions that supports an embodied understanding of the environment without our conscious control. Right, so before I had to come up here and pace across the stage a number of times to make sure that I wasn't going to you know, fall into the audience. So now I have some kind of proprioceptive awareness. In Cashin, we can consider the bodily training needed to navigate one's narrow cell. Right, one is in one's cell, one is sitting upon one's mat, one can feel these things as part of one's environment, and they help train and focus the individual. Second, the body resides in and uses situation and task environments. So think about when you packed your suitcase or duffel bag for San Diego. Instead of computing the optimal measurements for your goods in order to fit in your various papers, books, investments, you probably engaged in a trial and error process of spatial problem solving. Through habit and offline ways of knowing, you determine the best fit. In Cashin, we can recall the green eggs and ham list, right, where one determines the best fit of the Selmic verse to the needs of different affective scenarios. Problem solving is not just spatial, it's also affective and helps one fluidly engage the environment. Third, the way that the body solves cognitive tasks depends on how the body has developed and evolved from its natural and social environments. Keeping with our example of constant recitation, we can observe the biological development of the structure and shape of the tongue and vocal cords as they're impacted and enable certain kind of linguistic development. One might also think of the different kind of social practices. Saba Mahmoud, for example, who's a theorist and ethnographer, talks about Egyptian women who choose to engage in forms of Islamic piety by adopting the hijab. Women describe how it makes them feel more pious, more centered. Cashin too describes the monastic habit in terms of the form and function alike, indicating how it shapes one's cognition. Fourth, we have the physical, biological, social, and or cultural environments. That is, cognition extends beyond the boundaries of the human in its intersection with the biological, physical, social, and cultural worlds. Your cognition is extended to your smartphone, your computer, even your old-fashioned day planner. Right, because you can offload that information onto these devices and consult them when needed. So I guess this is a caution to use your environments well. Unifying these four aspects of the body mean that the body is not just a vehicle for cognitive processes. Right? This is not just happening in the brain. The body is not just physical hardware to run cognitive functions. Rather, Suk says, it plays critical cognitive roles, that is active information processing roles, by extending the boundary of cognition beyond the inner mind of the cognitive agent. And Sook here builds upon many researchers that I also find useful, Kenneth Azawa, Lawrence Barsalu, Alvin Noe, Mark Wollens, Tony Camaro, and others. 
The sensory motor activities of the body in interaction with its environment, in other words, is causally constitutive of perception, awareness, and cognitive processing. Cognition and moral cognition more particularly operates not just in the brain, but is also shaped by the body, motivated by emotion, mainly non-conscious, but also consciously deliberative, and extended into the social and natural environments. There's no time here, but we could also give additional attention to the role of priming in the work of habituation, the role of simulation and understanding the importance of imitation, imagery, and narrative identity, as well as the role of emotions in cortical and subcortical shaping of behavior. Understandings and embodied cognition, especially when considered an ethical text that push the normative boundaries of the modern philosophical framework, can be used to understand the particular features of Cashin's ethical program, amongst others. So too may Cashin's texts help us open up comparative space for understanding different contemplative practices, similarly focused on the body, emotions, and inner sociality. In short, the, the phenomenological struggles of first-person experience. Parsing these forms of awareness is necessary in order to see how we might work towards their integration. He gives a sense not only of how these practices work, and how they so importantly require bodily action, emotional cultivation, and reflective orientation, but how to negotiate them in the day-to-day -day struggles common to all. all right, he's remarkably frank in all of these aspects. My analyses of the mechanisms of Cashin's ethical formation include social habitus, but they also help us understand the cognitive processes of the aesthetic's sensory motor body, and how we recognize the role of intentional cultivation and critical vigilance that Cashin's first personal perspective fosters. Such a reading of Cashin's practices refuses the Foucauldian distinction of inner space at the site of the self in favor of an integrated view of subjectivity as operating with multiple sites of subjectivity. Such an integrated way of understanding the constitution of cognitive processing through embodied, extended, and conscious aptitudes brings us closer to late antique Greco-Roman medical and philosophical milieu within which Cashin wrote. Cashin interests me from the perspective of embodied cognition and contemplative practice because, for all of his beatification of these desert elders, he's realistic, and he's also attentive to the practical, bodily, environmental, and adaptive necessities of the monastic profession. What Cashin shows us, then, is that we can be educated. We can parse these mechanisms, and we can figure out how we can be a part of that process of transformation. We can be a part of this process, not only in order to shape ourselves, but also to start opening the space to think about our interconnectedness with others, to take as a given the inner sociality that is required for any of these practices to flourish. I didn't have time here, but in light of the last week, I wish that I had actually talked about the deeply inner social nature of Cashin's work. Right? Everything is in community. Nothing is in isolation, and everything has a deep sense of how humanity itself needs to be recognized, and how inner subjectivity is also going to be at the heart of the true contemplative. So more on that later. So we now have an embodied Cashin, who not only reflects in his practices the concerns of contemplative studies, but he also productively illuminates how mechanisms of research and embodied cognition might be seen as trainable, right, as engageable in and through an ethics as one's own way of life. If the work in embodied cognition is so important to understanding Cashin, and if Cashin provides us such great insight into the mechanisms of human transformation, what might account for any reticence that I expressed earlier in pursuing pedagogy in contemplative studies? Well, I don't think most of us with good historical reason are ready to start leading students in a day-long process of psalmic recitation, at least not outside of a devotional context. Not because they're hypocrites, but because of the historical mission of the secular American university. To contextualize this question in relation to anxieties particular to Christian traditions, I want to turn quickly now to, the, to link the public life of the modern university with a history of its emergence. Now, this is going to be a really embarrassing condensation into a few lines of a very complex history. Okay? So this is just the, the framework, the, the bones here. We see at its origins Catholic monastic centers giving rise to medieval universities between the 9th and 13th century. 
Deeply steeped in the monastic milieu, universities across Europe negotiated the tension between monastic figures and knowledge acquisition and transformation on the one hand, and political figures preoccupied with issues of social control. You had dramatic riots in the streets of Paris and an appeal from the faculty to the king over and against local political authorities, which contributed to the embrace of the university system. Grappling with theological identities and these kinds of issues would continue for the next millennium. In the 19th and 20th centuries, many of these universities at this time, uh, predominantly Protestant, also aspired towards a particular form of secularism. Protestantism as an alternative to Catholic educational institutions that have never fallen away, opens space for critical inquiry beyond the scope of the papal seal. And yet, as the predominant force in the United States by the turn of the 20th century, the legacies of Protestant identity spanned nearly all universities that were not Catholic, according to Marston Soul of the American University. Their religious roots continuously exerted influence, if increasingly tacit, on the self-identity as the Protestant establishment submitted to the rise of scientific ideologies, where forms of positivism precluded treatment of beliefs and values in form of empiricism and the conceit of pure objectivity. In the United States, the hegemony of Protestant Christianity as a social and political identity posed a problem for the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, notably the freedom of religion. Christian prayer in the classroom, Christian norms of conduct, Christian views on politics, these had the effect of not only proselytizing Christianity, but also obscuring the voices of others and preventing pluralism in religion. These issues came to a head in the US Supreme Court case, Abington School District versus Shemp in 1963. At this time, the court ruled that it is unconstitutional to have devotional practices in public schools. Respecting the First Amendment required freedom of religion and no state-sponsored practices. At the same time, we might note Justice Tom Clark made it clear that the study of religion is vital in the pluralistic society that these protections were asserted in support of. He says it might well be said that one's education is not complete without a study of comparative religions or the history of religion and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. Incidentally, I'm part of a, of a team in DC right now where we're trying to establish national standards through the National Council of Social Science for K through 12 education, trying to include the study of religion alongside history, politics, government, economics, et cetera, really because this constitutional issue shows that it's necessary to have this training in religion in our increasingly fractured as well as diverse world. From 1974, the standards created by religious studies scholar James Pinnock have been used, adapted only slightly, and spread in 2000 to all public schools, the National Council of Social Science, and the US Department of Education. These give us a framework to understand constitutionally sound study. They say, the school's approach to religion is academic, not devotional. The school strives for student awareness of religions, but do not press for student acceptance of any religion. The school sponsors study about religion, not the practice of religion. The school may expose students to a diversity of religious views, but may not impose any particular view. The school educates about all religions. It does not promote or denigrate any religion. The school informs the students about religious beliefs. It does not seek to conform students to any particular belief. So we see here this list that highlights the need for caution when considering what counts as knowledge impartable in the classroom. Students were once addressed not merely as mechanisms that can be taught to think, but to their whole selves as thinking, feeling, willing beings, as Edgar Lovett, the first president of Rice University, which is my home institution, set out in 1912. And I think it is to the detriment of our educational system if we do not recognize the learner in all of her complexity. In addition to the learner, we must consider the professors, educators, and leaders from such a perspective. Follow the wisdom of my teacher and friend, Hal Roth, who wrote in the BDH in 2013, we need to model for our students the values we teach them to bring to the world. We can't just talk about them, we have to live them. We need to treat the university's employees as compassionately as we advocate our students act, and we need to help them realize that the values we wish to bring to the world at large must start within the hearts as well as minds of each and every one of us. However, prescribing practices that have a religious origin and set of orienting principles becomes problematic when considering Christian contemplation. Christianity has at its time shaping the institutional and ethical lives of students, and the courts rule that it is unsuitable for public education, no prayer, no practice in the classroom. In the case of Abington, this conversation did not have a purely critical function. 
Preventing Christian proselytizing in public schools enabled the development of the study of religion, and it ensured a pluralism that better protected religious identities not in the Christian mainstream, a protection as necessary as ever now that we see not just the last week occurring, but also the rise of hate crimes in the last couple of days alone on the basis, oftentimes, of religion. This tension, then, between a monastic emergence and the pursuit of secularism, between religious identification and its purported disavowal is particularly clear in the study of religion. This is an opportunity for us to recognize what the boundaries of contemplative studies are, whether it's pluralist enough to welcome in Christianity, and what normative work looks like in the academic study of religion more broadly. In the interest of pluralism, Christian practice could not figure into the classroom. But these standards also raise a vital question. What counts as study versus practice, especially when theorizing ethics, as in my case? I think we need to continue this debate, extending even Panach's 1974 list with our increasingly sophisticated understanding of religious practices and the critical function of embodiment. We need to recognize the risk taken when we include practices in the classroom without proper training for the students, without proper contextualization of the practices, which of course raises the problem of what is sufficient background, and without adequate training for teachers who need to be able to anticipate the challenges that might arise in such practices. These are not debates over belief and dogma. They are debates over practices and embodiment. And now that feels like contemplative studies and research in embodied cognition help us to see the power of such embodied practices, we need to also be mindful of the ways in which their power is deployed and question how well we can extricate the practices from a set of values and beliefs. So in this section, I provide an overview of the role of Christian religious traditions in the institutional life of the mind. But I do this in order to challenge us, right? challenge us to see beyond the religious and secular divide, beyond the descriptive and normative divide, beyond the objective and subject chasm. I'm a scholar of religion who's invested in keeping lines of communication between different approaches in the study of religion open. There's so much to be gained by recognizing the perspectives of practitioners and theorists alike. Cashin's integrated perspective on subject formation itself taught me this. So to conclude, I think contemplative studies reflects one of the most powerful institutional ways of thinking about multidisciplinarity, using the knowledge from a variety of fields, humanistic, scientific, and artistic, to illuminate human experience today. The methodological developments in contemplative research programs are vital for troubling any facile distinction between objective science and subjective humanities. The humanities are not merely interpretive, nor are the sciences value neutral. Pushing the boundaries of how we conceive of relevant data, mode of analysis, and potential therapeutic outcomes seems vital to me as an ethicist and someone deeply committed to understanding the varieties of theories and methods in the study of religion. I want, in short, to be able to have researchers and scholars from across the spectrum learn to talk to each other without reaching dogmatic impasses. That was what my mental religion book was doing. It was bringing together cognitive science of religion people with Buddhism and neuroscience people, very different epistemologies and methodologies sometimes. And yet these are the approaches that are out there, and we need to learn how to talk to each other and to not cross purposes instead. For research, then, I think it's necessary to push the limits of what we know in order to see how we might think differently. For pedagogy, however, I'm more cautious. When it comes to what should be taught in the classroom, I'm too aware of the way in which a particular Christian normativity has been foundational to the identity of the university system and its associated influence on public education. We need to have protections for pluralism if we are to learn from and with each other. As an ethicist, I think it's necessary to recognize the normative dimensions of descriptive formations of action and thought. As an historian of Christianity, I think it is imperative that we do not engage students in Christian contemplative practices that cannot be extricated from their broader normative frameworks of Christian beliefs, practices, and narratives. As embodied cognition research helps us see, there is power in bodily knowing and its ability to shape human cognition. The salience of multiple sides of subjectivity, as I call it, building from work in late antique ethics and contemporary embodied cognition alike, reflects anything at all. It is that bodily affect of an intellect of awareness are always co-imbricating and co-constituting. As Cashin so powerfully shows, the awareness of body, emotions, and mind must come together in order to forge dispositions to act, to feel, and reflect spontaneously. This is going to affect not only how we shape ourselves, but how we treat others. The expert in the contemplative life, then, is the exemplary figure for how to reflect on the possibilities for understanding ethical formation. So now that we can understand, from the perspective of embodied cognition, how practices cannot be extricated from beliefs and vice versa, 
how might we think about the best way to work towards, first, the possibilities of pluralism, and second, the possibilities for developing a pluralist ethics that Varela calls our attention to and to which I myself am so committed? I certainly don't have the answers to that right now, but I do have an obviously frustrating set of questions, right? A set of questions and a set of traditions that we can engage. I hope that these questions can contribute to a conversation that is imminently critical and charitably oriented towards these common goods. So I'll close then with a 2012 call from another co-founder of the modern life, known to the world as the Dalai Lama, for his call for an ethics beyond religion in a pluralist world, for compassion, for wisdom, because meeting each other as humans is more vital than ever in our fractured times. And this is a talk that he gave at Brown in 2012. And here, he was speaking very directly to the students. He kept wanting to know. It's like, OK, people above 30, you're out. <laughs> people in your 20s, OK. People under 15, OK, you, you are my audience. Right? It's the youth. And it's the youth that we need to address. It's the youth we need to engage. And to the youth, he says, you must find a nonviolent approach based on strong, genuine spiritual brotherhood, sisterhood, a oneness of humanity on this same planet. I think we can reach out through this way. I too agree. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so sorry that everything went over, but um, I so appreciate your eyes and ears. If you have any questions, please feel free to come see me now or pester me at some other point during the day. Thank you so much again.